Wow, it's beautiful. <laughs> Woo -hoo, so beautiful. That was amazing. That. Thank you so much. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I haven't heard uh, piano in, in way too long. I'm realizing now. Thank you so much. That was enchanting. Um, okay, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Katie Zuber. I am the co-host tonight for our 27th Music and Speaker Series event. Really excited about this one. Ulu is one of my all-time favorite foods. It's one of my baby's all-time favorite foods. So super excited to chat more about this incredible superfood breadfruit and learn more about it with Anissa Lucero of Hawaii Ulu Co-op. So we've got her as our speaker tonight. We also have the lovely Idine Sandberg, who you just heard. She's an incredible musician from the Big Island. Uh, Anissa's from the Big Island as well. So very excited about tonight's event. Thank you all for being here. If you have questions for either of um, the individuals tonight speaking or playing music, please post it in the chat feature. Please post to everyone so we can all see it. If you have any tech questions or anything specific about membership, please chat to me, Katie Zuber. You can do a direct message in the chat feature. If you ever have any suggestions or things you'd like me to share for our social media or weekly newsletters that we send out, anything ag related, please send me an email. My email is hfuu at hfuu.org. If you're not receiving our weekly emails and you're a member, please let me know. Those emails are full of good stuff, grants, upcoming events, workshops. So 
It's a great way to find out what we are all up to. Make sure to also follow us on social media, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It's at HFUU official. I'll post that in the chat feature as well. If you're not on social media or Instagram, please let me know just so I can kind of have you on my radar. I've got a few people that I um, text things to that aren't on social media. I'm gonna pass things off to our organization president, the incredible Vincent Mina. Um, he's gonna share more about our convention and what we've got going on with HFUU. Well, you're incredible. Just bounced back to you because you are that, Katie. Thank you so much for what you do to make these so smooth. And and Edine, oh my goodness gracious, girlfriend. Beautiful music. Just love the piano, the lighting. Enchanting was a great word, Katie. I thought the same thing. That's really beautiful. And the lighting really helps. Bring oh, it yeah, it's all good. I, mean, I was just kind of going after a long day of work. I was just kind of melting in the chair, you know. Going, oh, man, this is sweet. Really sweet. So, aloha, everybody. Um, we'll, we'll hear more music from Edine as we go along here a little later on. I wanted to uh, ask Katie to put up our Just Out Today poster here for our upcoming. Whoa, it's pretty. There you go. For, can everybody see that? I hope they can. This is our upcoming annual convention. We just got approval on Friday from the county to be able to hold it. And we had planned to be at Uncle Bobby Paia's farm this year. And oh, I'm so sad that we're not physically able to be there, that everybody can get together once again, like we've had these amazing conventions of the past. But, you know, we got some lemons with COVID and we're making lemonade, organic lemonade, as a matter of fact. And that's going to happen. How we how we pitched this to the county to get approval was what I wanted to do is bring in all the chapter presidents. So we have 13 chapters across the state, bring all the chapter presidents here to Maui and then all meet together at Haleakua in Huelo, which is a farm retreat center in Huelo, beautiful farm retreat center. And to on the 3rd of November, then on the 4th of November, we will go to we will go to um, two farms. Well, the, it'll open up, as you can see here on the poster, with a breakfast presentation. And I, we have Ray Archuleta from the movie Kiss the Ground is going to be speaking. Dan Kittredge, a friend of mine from the East Coast, who's developed a bionutrient meter on the path to a nutrient density meter and, and our ability to test food for its nutrient value. That's just amazing. And I'm so stoked. Mine is going to be coming in in another month here. And Dan's going to be presenting on that. And then I'm um, in process to get confirmation of a man in Belize who's doing agroforestry uh, systems. And I want to have that as a as our third expert presenter, but he's not quite confirmed yet, still working on that. As I told you, we had just got approved on Friday, so we're kind of scrambling to get this all together. But I've been building it along, just not knowing whether it's going to be a complete physical convention or not. But now that it's a hybrid, what we did was figured we'd have these breakfast presentations on Zoom. And then right after the presentation, everybody gets in the car and we go to two farms each day. And those farms are going to be, as you can see here on Thursday, is Bobby Paia's Hawaii Taro Farm. And our farm, Kahano Aina Greens, my wife Irene and our farm. And then uh, on Friday, we're going to have Maui Bees, Mark and Leah Damon which is an amazing farm up there, whole systems farm with animals and bees and vegetables and fruits and just an amazing, amazing operation. And then Nature Works Nursery in Makawal, Giante Naima Nand, doing an amazing job with grafting all their trees. And through these farm demonstrations, uh, through these farm visits, we'll have demonstrations being done too, specific demonstrations. So you'll not only get to see these farms, but you also get to see the interaction between all our chapter presidents and leadership with the farmers. And then on Saturday, Pono Grome Farm, Evan Ryan, who's one of our mentors of the FAM program, uh, and also Mark Dame is one of our mentors, and Bobby Paia is also. Uh, and then Hokunui Farm up in Makawal, uh, Corinne and Eric Frost. So we're really uh, excited about these six farms that we'll get to visit these farms. And then after these visits will happen, and it's going to be live streamed. We're working it out, the contract with Akaku, our public television station here in Maui. 
and then once once folks are you know visit these uh, once we visit these farms and folks and live streams that are attending the convention we're going to go back to the retreat center and open up zoom there and we're going to have for the first hour a interactive q, q a with the farmer being there with us at Haleakua and all the chapter presidents so we can have a discussion about what we experienced uh, that day. And then there's also going to be an a la carte offering of hemp and soil health protocols. People can choose in what they want to do for the second hour. Um, I know Drake Weinart's on the call here tonight. Aloha, Drake. He's going to be talking about KNF, Korean Natural Farming. We got Cab Baber who's going to be uh, doing a Bukashi demonstration. So all these soil health initiatives, Bob Schaefer, our agronomist here in Hawaii, we'll be talking about cover crops. And, you know, just be able to communicate these tracks around soil health and then also hemp. We have Doug Fine and Gail Baber who are, you know, working up panel discussions for our hemp tracks that we'll have each day. You know, soil health will be each day. And then on, there's also going to be an offering for two of the days for food value chain coordination. And, and that's uh, from the Wallace Center, these experts on strategies of value chain coordination and also mapping your regional uh, value chain. In other words, all, these, all, the, all, the, all the movement around food hubs and, and such and moving food around, being able to collaborate and cooperate with all our food systems to get the food spread out through Hawaii A. So it's really, it's gonna be a very provocative time together and I'm not, everything I've been hearing back from people is that they really like the format. And so we're, we're excited about that and, and, and hope that uh, everyone here, and, and please tell your friends that uh, to attend, it's gonna be very affordable. And, uh, and then you'll be supporting our ability to do educational outreach moving forward. So um, stay tuned for more information on this. But again, this is gonna be from November 4th through the 6th these three days of virtual farm tours and presentations. And then on the 7th will be the business of the organization. We have to, this year's an election year for our vice president. And then any policy and bylaw work that needs to be done uh, will be done at that time. And uh, that'll give people who have been members from August 29th, if you're a member up until August 29th, that you're already a member, uh, then you'll be able to vote as a delegate. And um, uh, that's what we're going to have is delegate voting. Uh, and then um, after that, uh, uh, folks that are members now will be able to attend at a, a, a more affordable rate, which is going to be really inexpensive, this convention. So we look forward to you folks supporting us and supporting yourself in, in just all this valuable educational outreach that will be made available for everyone. So. Stay tuned for more information. Katie will be sending out more information as we go forward. And that's about it. So, um, Katie, do you want to bring in Anissa? I sure do. She must start her video. Hey. Hey. Anissa, Luciero. <laughs> How's it going, Vince? All right, dear. How are you doing? I mean, I love your background there. I mean, you're a surfer girl, and look what you have in your background that's surrounding your head. I mean, that's that's pretty provocative, I gotta say. <laughs> did you just grab that shark, and as you were surfing, did you just grab it and take it in with you and get the jaws? Yeah. Poke the eyes out. I tell you, you're you're bad. You're, you know, you're bad, girl. I love it. Well, welcome, and it's so nice to have you here tonight with us. I was very excited when you said yes, and I just want to extend our warmest aloha to you and your family. I know your grandfather just passed, and my God, you're you're leaving tonight right after this. You had to go to Colorado, be with your family, so I know everyone here. I just want to ask everyone to just say a prayer and extend your aloha to Anissa and her family, and uh in the passing of a loved one. So I, I know all about that and what it represents. So, you know, um, yeah, our hearts go out to you, dear. Thank you. Appreciate and thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, it's, uh, it's really, it's really great. So this is exciting for me because we met back in 2014 at a hip agriculture dash Kerr, who's our Kohala president 
and his his nonprofit uh, uh, hip agriculture, uh, and he does a lot of educational outreach himself through hip him and his wife Erica, and they put on these great conventions. Uh, uh, basically, it reminded me. I told Dash reminded me of our body and soil conferences that we produced here on Maui, and um, I met you there, and I was like, wow, look at this bright light. And you are, and you are that, and and you know it was really wonderful to see you grow into your farmer training through the Kohala Center, and then into doing you now. Tell tell us tell everybody about what drove you to do a fund GoFundMe to want to go down to Samoa. Tell us the story about how that all about came to be. Oh gosh, yeah. So I would, became a part of the co-op. Um, well, Malakalu, Ulu, Ulu co-op. Um, well, Malakalu Ulu initially um, okay. back in 2016. Yep, the spring of, and um, that was with Donna and Noah. They had just won the Mahiai matchup um, and uh, received were awarded the the four acre parcel. Just it's just under four acre, acres in Ka and um, Kelakikua Bay. Mm. Uh, and you know it was for a breadfruit business plan and so back when i was doing um the kohala beginner farmer training program i had this wild interest in breadfruit which a lot of my mentors at the time were kind of like uh maybe <laughs> like, <laughs> a good crop um but you know i you know i learned about ulu through actually reading um noah lincoln's um hawaiian uh, and native plants book um which i picked up at the at the jagger museum um hmm. at the volcano and you know i learned about canoe crops and um you know that they provided sustenance and basically like building material and 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 provided everything that the hawaiians needed to to live sustainably and Ulu, of course, is a big part of it. So anyway, living in Kelakikua and really interested in farming and sustainability, um, you know, Ulu just kind of came. And so I became a part of the small co-op, which that our farm is really, um, in a way, the impetus for the larger cooperative. Okay. And so um, the, the co-op, um, Malakalu Ulu, was awarded a grant through the USDA and then, you know, just kind of realizing like, wow, you know, we have some supply of ulu. Um, there are other farmers out there that are also, you know, growing ulu and processing. Like, you know, we can't really do it alone. And um, Donna Shapiro, of course, her background is in, in cooperatives. What a rock star, yeah. yeah. And you know she got her master's in in cooperatives. She's from a kibbutz um, community in Israel, which mm. is a cooperative um, right. community. And right. so um, it was just kind of natural that way that you know Ulu kind of came in to be uh, a cooperative, or that that we have a cooperative with Ulu. And um, yeah, her and, so Noah, her and Noah is like one plus one equals three. You know, I remember he did a presentation for us at one of our speaker series and talked about Malka, of where you are, uh, and the what is it, like 18 miles of that one uh, that one um, altitude of Ulu, that band of Ulu that was growing many many months ago, right? Yeah, yeah, and they actually met at um, the whole Ulu Ka Ulu festival. Um, oh, so <laughs> they met at a breadfruit festival, which was kind of cute. That's um, cute. That's great. Cute. Yeah. Yeah, so, but yeah, yeah I, had the, like, oh. I had the I had the fortune of them coming to visit our farm, and with the with the children, and it was really sweet. And uh, yeah, great people. The um, so you're in K Bay. The the four acres is in, above K Bay. Uh, what's how much? Oh, what's the the elevation? Uh, so we're at about seven hundred feet elevation. Oh, okay, okay. I for Ulu. Um, they say that the Kalu Ulu Belt was um, kind of like the, the highway, Mamalohoa Highway. Right, right. Um, that's at like 1,500 feet elevation and then okay. kind of somewhere in between like 700 and 400 feet elevation. And that's where there's like ample rainfall, but, um, you know, at times it can uh, get dry because, you know, dur during different seasons, you know, it might be prone to drought. 
Um, so Ulu being, you know, more resistant and, and drought tolerant, um, breadfruit was just a great crop to grow um, in that zone. And what, what varieties are you growing in that zone? Yeah, so our farm, I think we have five varieties. We have Hawaiian, um, Ma'afala, of course, um, Ulufiti, uh, Otea, um, Pua'a, and we actually have some others that are in pots like um, lipid and like heart and some other, you know, funky um, ulu varieties and a toke lao, um, but we haven't planted them out yet. So, you know, the five main varieties that are now five and a half years old and wow. some others that are in the nursery. And we have, and what eight, your, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish what you're we, saying. We have 80 trees planted. Wow. And, um, we planted, I think now about three acres. So we have about another acre to, to go. To, to Beautiful. Go. And you're doing it agroforestry style or how, how are you uh, uh, doing it? How are you setting it, your farm up? Yeah, so the top acre is what we call the restoration zone. And that's where we're planting all Hawaiian canoe crops, you know, Maia, Ohia'ai, Kalo, and Olena, and Pia, and you know, so on. Um, and we also have some natives like Mamaki. And then um, we had have our adaptation zone, which is more of like contemporary crops. Um, so, so like, you know, doing interplanting with um, white pineapple mm. and um, some cacao. And now we're kind of you know, we, we pulled away from Olena, that was a part of the original business plan, but just because there wasn't really a, a stable market and, you know, the the time and effort into process or sure. harvest, um, was, you know, a lot. Um, but yeah, we still have Olena and I'd like to see us do more um, like, you know, diverse multi-story alley croppings. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you were talking to me earlier about in uh, Brazil, how folks are doing that. You're connected with folks in Brazil that are doing that, that you're learning from as far as the value and, 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 and what you can do with alley cropping. I know right there in that area you're talking about, it's like, you know, Kona topsoil, six feet of lava, right? So you're, you're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, biomass uh, composting and okay. mulching and stuff, right? To, to create right. your soil there. Yeah. Keep that moisture that you, uh, do. I love the drainage though aspect of it. I mean, even during when it's dry, you know, you still have that the roots being able to go down deeper and 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 have the uh, sustain any kind of a dry period. Yeah, because you, you have the ground covered in that spirit, right? Yeah. So we're on Rock Bottom Road, which is about twenty five hundred year old lava rock flow. Uh -huh. or lava and so we've got like big rocks that are about this size just everywhere and hardly any topsoil and there's you know when we were out planting the ulu trees we'd just like move away the rocks and be like there's no soil <laughs> and we'd like plug in an ulu with like a little bit of soil that was in the pot and then just you know <laughs> put the rocks around and, and amazingly they grow and actually right. bob bob schaefer he's my neighbor and oh good they put in a telephone pole and they dug in like I think nine feet or something and he said that he like took a peek down into the hole and there was just like this black uh humus that was at the bottom wow he, his thought is that you know you have the 2500 year old lava flow and then sitting underneath it is like an old forest and, yes. and oil under there that the trees are tapping into yes right right and bob he's brilliant you know i'm really um happy that he's uh part of our ohana here at hfuu and so nice that uh you live close to your neighbors that's wonderful glad to hear that um the, so good let me get back to what i initially was talking about with your crowdfunding and what got you you know tell us that story about the, your introduction to samoa ulu and and the world being around the world uh, leaders in that respect. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I started working at the co-op. They opened up the facility in Hanalo in 2017. And that was our first year in Kona having this big aggregation site um, and processing um, kitchen. Uh, prior to that, everything was processed out of a Sweet Cane Cafe. Oh, um, wow. In Hilo, year, in Hilo. Out of yeah, their right. 
And um, actually Jackie uh, Prell trained me on how to, to process Ula. I had never processed bread. Oh, that's before. great. And I mean, Jackie's small, small, such a small. sweetheart. Jackie's such a sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I learned a lot and I processed like maybe 200 pounds um, with her and she was training me because I was going to be basically, um, you know, assistant managing or managing um, the Hanalo facility and Donna and Noah um, were, were back in Oahu actually at that time. And so um, interestingly, like, you know, started processing and we just got slammed with, with Ulu. Like farmers started bringing fruit in and <laughs> more farmers signed up. And, you know, some of the bigger farms, um, you know, here in Kona, they um, came on board. And so that first year that we opened up Hanalo, we processed 42,000 pounds of Ulu. Wow. That was really like, being commercial like really being like commercial ready basically right um, high volumes we had a 300 square foot kitchen and we still do we still do all of our operations out of there and oh. in the past you know year or so they've they process i think eighty thousand pounds of ulu <laughs> um, and, and um well anyway so i like to make all stories long just by the way <laughs> okay we love hearing you that's okay um, so yeah, we I went through that first season, which was really hard. I mean, we all worked our our butts uh, off, and you know, like trying to coordinate with farmers, and you know, Favor of love, the bumps and and rocky road of just you know starting in a new a new business. Right. Um, Testing so, your commitment level. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that and my my um, analogy was like okay, um, we're in the va'a, like, and, <laughs> and, and we've got a whole, like, there's a, there's a couple holes in the va'a, and we're just, like, trying to make it to, like, Tahiti to get more supplies, patch her up, so we're smooth sailing again, you know, right. um, we're smooth sailing, but, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I was still really invested in Ulu, and it's just, you know, um, the Breadfruit Institute was just a huge proponent of, you know, my, my inspiration um, for, for seeking breadfruit as, you know, something that I wanted to do um, with my life. <laughs> and uh, one of the, the most powerful things that I read was that 80% of the world's um, population um, that, it, that suffers from malnutrition and, and poverty um, they reside along the equatorial belt and mm. that's where breadfruit can grow. And so, wow. breadfruit, you know, being highly productive, um, nutritious, you know, starchy fruit that, you know, grows on a tree, um, you know, basically can grow in, you know, all sort of multitude of soils, um, even to degraded soils, to sand, like why, like, this is just such an incredible um, opportunity um, to uplift, you know, commu communities around the world. Not, gly um, not glycemic, right? Not, not high like sugar. Low glycemic, low glycemic right. which is different from like white rice or right. white potatoes. Yeah. So sweet too. So, you know, how, how nice that the, that's not a cruel joke, that it's so sweet and it's good for you, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, people can hardly tell the difference, um, of Ulu and, potato if it's in a chowder um, mm, that's right similar, but you know one has more nu nutrients and and is low glycemic so right. and of course you know being in hawaii it's it's grown locally that's right <laughs> but that's so, right yeah, i ended up just um wanting to to actually experience a place that utilized ulu and, mm -hmm. and valued it um you know from in a day to everyday life of course people value it here in hawaii um, right. But, you know, I was kind of looking like, where's, where's the mentor for, for Ulu and, um, and, and it, and it led me to Samoa. Um, I did, you know, understood that they, of course, still utilize it as um, a main staple. And um, so, yeah, I, I decided I wanted to go to Samoa um, and I put together a GoFundMe campaign um, and 
you know, making the video, I had a really good friend, um, John Bodie helped me, helped me do it. He was kind of starting off his videography career and um, he offered to do it with me and um, we launched it and it went you know broad on Facebook and again it's just you know social media has been an incredible tool um, right. and um, I actually when I was at a African dance um, class a woman would approach me and her name is Sala and she's like oh she's like you're the Ulu girl. I oh, saw I most of you on on Facebook, and she's like, "I'm from Samoa," and she's like, "I," she's like, "I'll I'll let I'll meet I'll I'll introduce you to my family," and um, she just opened up the door, and so she actually, um, you know, I connected with her family, and I also had um, connections through the YWAM base, um, which I also stayed at. Um, but so, yeah, I stayed with the local family, stayed with the YWAM base. I also got to attend the Global Breadfruit Summit in 2017. Wow. Um, yeah. So happy yeah. that that summit happened before the pandemic a couple of years later, right? That you're able to actually, you know, cement that into your psyche as far as, you know, where this could lead in, in a leadership role for Hawaii and a, uh, as such an important crop to get people Akamai to, you know? Yeah, and that trip was incredible. Not only meeting, you know, researchers, um, you know, people right. who are in government sectors, interested in breadfruit for food security purposes, for like independent island nations, like the um, Emeritus or Emeritus. Oh gosh, I'm terrible at pronouncing, but um, that Mer was really- Right. Yeah. Yes and people in Fiji, but what was really astounding was the amount of breadfruit trees <laughs> that oh. are there. And, you know, that we kind of, cause it's like, okay, breadfruit trees need to be pruned. Obviously we have to, to keep them short and the fruit access accessible. Mm -hmm. And so in here in Hawaii, there's, you know, not a ton of trees that you can look to and say, oh, okay, like, that's how you would you would prune you know this tree whereas like avocado and mango all of all of those other like more uh, established and and well-researched crops they have you know pruning practices and so seeing all of the breadfruit trees in such an array of in, uh, in environments like from growing in the sand mm. straight in the sand 15 mm. feet away from the ocean <laughs> I stayed at this village um, called Uwala Village, and it's a really hot coastal um, village. And you know, the sun is like beating down, and it's just like all lava rock. But yet, there's people living there, and the there's ulu trees all around everybody's oh, fale. Huh? They call it a fale instead of hale, and it really. Huh? keeps the area cool and like mm. and livable and then it also is providing food um so yeah and, and so how long did you spend how long did you spend there three weeks wow beautiful that's great you know there's a a brother of a different mother one of my neighbors is on tonight peter he brings me ulu from wailua when he's down he's a place in, in inside country and you know I mean, it's such a, the, the, the flavor, when it, it just goes so well with everything. And so you did a lot back in 2019 when we had our convention, Mahi Pono, and you presented to everybody and you were doing recipes and stuff like that. You want to talk a little bit about preparing it? Yeah. So um, breadfruit, the most important part, I'd say, for preparing ulu is really picking the right maturity stage for what you're cooking. And so ulu is extremely versatile. It can go from pickles to potato-like to, you know, being made into desserts and baked goods. And so breadfruit having these different maturity stages as it ripens, it allows for, you know, this versatility. And so starting from, you know, baby, <laughs> baby stage, uh, when the fruit is young and, and less than a softball size, mm -hmm. that's considered baby fruit. And okay. you can steam that and 
and that that and young wow like a, yeah that young and it's more of like a vegetable and so they oh, okay uh, it's like an artichoke heart. It tastes just like artichoke heart. Wow, never had it that young. That's neat, I have to try that. Yeah, it's really good pickled. And then mm. there's like, of course, the green fruit. And um, a lot of people when they've, you know, had ulu and, and in my experience, I went to an event and they served ulu and it was like a little undercooked and I could tell it was a little under mature. And mm -hmm. so it's like when it kind of gives it that like hard rubbery flavor, mm -hmm. um, that's like when it's immature, we call it when it's mostly green um, and the spikes on the ulu are kind of pokey. Um, and so in that case, like it's still edible, you just want to cook it longer and it's a little bit um, more watery consistency. Yeah. And of course, there's the prime, which is like the golden egg on the tree that shines. And it's when it turns like brown and, and golden. And that's when the starches um, have have really start to develop and um, and it's becoming even slightly sweet. Um, well, so anyway, it's still it's firm. Still firm. Okay. It's still firm. Yeah. So I guess like a subtle hint of that ulu flavor, but um, still firm, you can steam it. My favorite way to prepare ulu is by par cooking it. Um, by par cooking it, you're really making it um, li like uh, potato like. And so at that point, when it's been par steamed for let's just say 15 minutes, um, now it's like a potato. And so you can shred it, you can make hash browns, um, you can, you know, steam it a little bit longer, like another 15 minutes. So it's fully cooked and you can make like mashed potatoes. And one of my favorite <clears throat> favorites is, uh, ulu patties. So you chop mm -hmm. up some veggies, saute them, little onion, garlic, and throw in your ulu mash and then fry it. So twice mm -hmm. cooked. Nice. And nice. then of course, you have ripe ulu when the ulu becomes soft and you know there's uh you know it can be really soft slightly soft um but that's great for scooping out um well not scooping out for pancakes yet but you can make like fried wedges and it's sweet um you can you know scoop that out and make sweet breads or something mm. and then there's the really ripe stage which the ulu co-op has a product called baker's ripe and that's when the ulu is so soft that it can't even be cut, but it, you have to scoop it out of the skin. Oh, and wow. It's perfect for, yeah, throwing in into baked goods, making bread pudding. Um, oh, nice. Wow. Wow, that's very cool. And, you know, I would think that uh, you put an egg into that, uh, uh, you know, when you're grating it, and with your vegetables and stuff like you're talking about, it kind of like make an ulu omelet in a sense, right? The, yeah, you could throw uh, an egg in there and it'll bind it. Add yeah, it binds it all food. together. Wow. I stay hungry already listening and talking yeah. about this. But, uh, you know, there's there's a, um, it's, why do you think it's so undervalued here in Hawaii or there hasn't been, is it a raising of the awareness of how to prepare it? Is that the issue, do you think, that a lot of people just don't know how to prepare don't know how to work with it uh, are people so used to the mainland food that they kind of you know or maybe is it just a, a kind of a renaissance in the hawaii uh, uh canoe crops what, what do you think's going on yeah i mean i think through my experience you know when i first got to the island i saw the ho'olu ka'ulu breadfruit festival and they had cooking contests and they've done a huge amount of of work and, and put an effort into um, educating about breadfruit. Um, and so like that, that's been really great. Um, and then I think too, the problem is accessibility. Um, and it's like the supply and demand thing, right? So right. If, if there's no supply, then there's no demand. Um, and so they kind of serve each other or that I've, I've seen it serve each other. So when we first started the co-op, back in 2016 we had our first summer we you know processed 12,000 pounds of breadfruit and we had the small little freezers from floor to ceiling um stacked with product and it's like oh my gosh what are we going to do with it you know mm -hmm. Donna uh, spent a huge amount of um effort going out with you know frozen ulu like ulu hummus and ulu chocolate mousse to the hotels and and saying hey this is you know breadfruit and you know providing um, you know some information about how to prepare it and 
and it's a local starch. Um, and so that with that, like little by little, people were catching out. Okay, breadfruit. Some already were well versed in breadfruit too, of course. Right. Um, and so then like we totally were overwhelmed with our supply, but then the demand shot up and we were sold out. Okay, then again in 2017, after you know, processing 42,000 pounds of fresh fruit and Again, we had freezers, like floor to ceiling. In fact, we had to outsource freezer space because we didn't oh. have enough. And so we were driving down to um, down to the ice house um, in Kona. And, you know, we had huge pallets just stacked with, with Ulu. And anyhow, you know, again, just kind of like, oh, gosh, we have so much Ulu. And then that demand going up. And also what helped was the farm to school program right. um, and the DOE, um, which now this is all changed, of course, you know, post COVID, but yes. um, eventually they were purchasing 50% uh, of, of our product. Wonderful. So we went to, you know, 50% of, you know, our, our product going to a customer to now that market being essentially gone because they closed our farm to school program. And so oh, now we've had to diversify um, our, our market, which is great. And now it's like made us more, you know, more more cautious and 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 resilient now that we can establish other types of markets like e-commerce. Right. Like, right. But now, so yeah, the 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 point that I don't quite understand is when you have something that's so nutrient rich, especially for our children. You know, I mean, our children are you know, glazed over in the morning after they're eating their Fruit Loops. And, you know, I mean, to have to have them being raised in the availability of this food being there for them and other canoe crops, I mean, bringing, and Bobby Paia is doing a lot of work in that spirit. There's a lot of, there's a lot of light bearers, you know, throughout the state that are, and especially are involved in our organization that's bringing that to light. Dash is doing a lot for the through the farm to school program. I, I'm just, you know, amazed that this doesn't, the legislature doesn't grab a hold of all of this in a way that we could really further our agricultural systems here in Hawaii in a way that will bring all these crops forward. Because as a farmer, you know, if you're just growing ulu, and you're trying to make your ends meet, you know, putting all this land in, in tree production and the amount of effort it goes into not only growing the trees, but keeping them healthy and, and uh, being able to harvest them, being able to get them processed and all of that. It, there's not much of, of a support there for the infrastructure it takes to, to make that occur. And I, I would think at some point we're going to be pushed up against the wall enough because that's what it seems like it takes the pandemic kind of raised some of that awareness but uh to where we really need to understand the value of kind of our own food production systems that we could put in place here right yeah, yeah. and i think that there's a lot of power in the cooperative model and right I mean, was to show that you know collectively you know we can do a lot and, and actually be movers in in our food chain system right on for change and um you know seeing the farmers come together and you know not only that we're also working with other organizations and have established partnerships like the farm to school hui um umu right. chef who guys and you know collectively you know we can make mass like educational material we can you know um source chefs to provide recipes which makes you know ulu more uh, approachable and yeah. then you know on on the infrastructure side with having so many farmers together you know in this large number now we have you know over a hundred farmers you know throughout white island and now we have um a couple farmers in, in maui and oahu mm -hmm. um that you know really i think is is powerful when it comes to you know the the legislator um and and making decisions right so, that's cool. That's cool. Well, you know, I have a little, a little story to share about okay. that. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure what year it was. I think it was like 2014, 2015. I'm not sure. But John Cadman, I called him up 
friend of mine, right? And hey, I know he's a chef and he works at Kamehameha, he was working at Kamehameha schools. And I said, John, you know, this is when I was president of the Maui chapter of Farmers Union. I said, John, could you do a chef's corner? Because that's what we'd have each month at our, at our, you know, meetings. We'd have a chef corner, then we had a farmer speak, you know. And, and he said, yeah, he said, I'd love to do a chef corner. He said, what do you want me to do it on? I said, well, I've been wanting to, to do something with Ulu, you know, and he says, you know, I've been meaning to work with Ulu and this would be a great opportunity to do that because he hadn't done anything. Right. Well, it turns out he goes like full on into it and he brings a presentation and everybody's wild about it. He goes the next weekend to Hana, enters his, his uh, dessert into a competition, gets first place calls me up two weeks later. He goes, you know what? It's all your fault. I go, what are you talking about? He said, I just quit my job at Kamehameha schools and I'm going full bore into an Ulu business. And so, you know, Pono Pies, right? And and John is just, you know, he just, he just had on his Instagram. I thought they were, these Ulus that were like huge, you know? And, wow. uh, and it was like, at first I didn't know they were Ulu, you know? And so he's rocking it. And uh, so it's so such a great ambassador here on Maui. And so it's nice that you, you know, with Donna and, and Noah and you and you folks, you know, working together with that uh, cooperative on Hawaii Island. Uh, this is, uh, I can see, you know, and you're so young, you know, by the time you get to the, the stage of, of, of your life there, where I'm at, I can see where this is just going to be catapulted forward in a way that we can look back and go, wow, you know, I, I hope I'm still alive to see this uh, all come to fruition. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Good thing. Big time dedication. That's right. Little by little. That's right. This methodical, you know, one thing I've learned over the years, because we've been in business now with our farm for 27 years is that it's, it's a methodical evolution. You know, it's, no matter, even if you have a lot of money and you want to throw out, you know, developing a farm really takes that methodical commitment, waxing on, waxing off, you know, in the trench every day. And uh, you evolve and you grow it. And, you know, my wife, Irene, and I uh, have, you know, developed a beautiful farm that we'll showcase at the convention. And, you know, speaking of which, you'll really enjoy the value chain presentations that are going to happen through the Wallace Center uh, during our convention. So, so get plugged into that. I think you'll really you really like that because it's so tied into the cooperative yeah yeah awesome i always enjoy going to the convention and i yeah. feel like that gains so much every time and it's it, yeah. And yeah it's it's fun isn't it you know it's all for us to all gather i'm sorry that we're not able to physically get together but you know there's some beautiful things happening within our organization and across all 13 chapters right now we're going to have our mini conventions happen happening. There's one happening in y and in January. We just had one in Kohala on the big island uh, several mm -hmm. months ago, you know, so Vincent Kimura is really big on bringing all that forward. So this way we can kind of like grow and build momentum up to the annual convention. And so I, I suspect that we'll be able to get together physically uh, with our conventions in the near future. In the meantime, though, we just work with what we have and, and do all that. Would, what is what is about Ulu that you feel people tonight may not know about that you want to share? Is there anything, any subtleties that you found along the way and that you'd like to share about either growing it or preparing it or or just uh, being in relationship with that food source? Hmm. First thing that came to mind was the Ulu likes light, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, a lot of sunshine um it it's it's resilient opening the canopy in other words right and uh in your pruning you let light in on the sides and and in the top right so it really likes yeah. to have all that yeah so for like a, a perfect you know ulu tree to 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 grow it, it does need a lot of sunlight and if there's other trees around it it will compete with it and try to stretch out and it's always just looking for the light and mm -hmm. the fruit mm -hmm. tends to bear or bears more where the the canopy is is sunny so if you have like an ulu next to like another tree that's that's big you know that other tree will shade, you know, that part of the canopy, and then you're not going to really see a whole lot of fruit there. 
Um, Interesting. So yeah. Do you do you because I notice in Hawaii when you know fruit trees that I've had like star fruit trees and fig and stuff when after it fruits it seems like it loves to get cut back and fed and then just kind of like it's almost like you're threatening its life but then going oh good I have energy to put out a whole new you know growth spurt and uh, and then fruit even more so so I can you know procreate you know so I won't be die, I won't die. Do you find that with Ulu? Does it like that after it gets like when is the fruiting season for Ulu? When is it the usual season for it to start fruiting and come to fruition for to harvest? Is there yeah. different varieties, different times of the year? Or? Yeah, so Ulu, I mean, it can fruit all year long. Uh, mm -hmm. Hawaiian variety will you know, put out some fruit here and there throughout the year. If you have, you know, a handful of trees, you can go out and likely it is that you'll find one ulu or so. Um, and it's bread fruit is giving in that way. And then, you know, our main season um, is kind of like two peak seasons. It starts in the late summer, somewhere around July, end of July, and we'll go, you know, through through August and slow down a little bit. There's a dip, but, you know, can still have, you know, some trickle through and then it peaks again this time of the year. Um, so even September, sometimes like it's kind of different year after year, but um, October and November are, are another peak peak month. Oh, so in the fall, it, it's a, a lot of the fruiting happens. I noticed that the, the spring and the fall, a lot of the fruit fruiting occurs in, in some of the trees like that. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah and I think something like two thirds of our entire Ulu supply come in our, our two peak months. Oh, so wow. Love 30,000 pounds of Ulu in, in, a, in a peak month. And then all that and all that uh, all the, the the rind and everything right makes amazing compost right just the worms just love you know breaking all that down yeah yeah well anti anti maona anti chantel um, right at the garden um right. we call her anti maona now it's kind Herself, of like our her kona president her. our kona president kona chapter president right <laughs> chantel yeah and so she she takes the compost from the ulu co-op, um, all of the food waste, the scraps um, from the ulu, but we're also doing co-crops um, with the co-op. And so that's been like a huge thing um, that we've come into in the past year or so. But um, the worms, her worms, they love the kalo peels and the sweet potato peels the most. Mm. And they will eat ulu. They like the ulu scraps, but because it's so starchy, the ulu, it gets really hot and wet, um, oh, which the okay. worms will still eat, but it's not their favorite, like the kalo skins and the walla skins are. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would think the shredded cardboard, it would help with that spirit, bringing in more carbon right. to that. Yeah, it'll help break it down. The, the, the microbes get in there in between all the shredding of the cardboard and and really help facilitate that breakdown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she's doing a lot of shredding car shredded cardboard there. And Maona, if anybody on this call is in the Kona area, go to Maona. And what is the name of the highway that goes down to the or city of refuge that is on the roads of Maona? I call it Hona Now Highway. Right. Um, Rodeo Grounds. That's another right. one. Um, you know, we're looking to have our convention there when the, oh. the yeah, in 2022 is the proposed convention to happen. I don't know now with with Uncle Bobby's the convention not being able to happen at Hawaii Taro Farm this year. Maybe we'll have to see what the board thinks, but maybe next year it'll be at Bobby's and then the year following be at the rodeo grounds. But that's what the plan is, is to get to the rodeo grounds uh, hey, with our convention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in your backyard. Yeah, right. Then we can all go to two step together, you know. <laughs> The um, yeah. So how many? What's your favorite? Do you have a favorite variety? Do you like okay. to eat or grow? Or? Oh gosh, I guess it's kind of like that saying with Uncle Jerry Konanui was like, uh -huh. whatever is on the table, whatever color is uh -huh. on the table is my favorite variety. That's cool. Um, but I I do really love maopo. It's such a beautiful tree. It has these more mitten like leaves. It's one of mm -hmm. the more popular varieties in Hawaii. Ma'opo. Um, Ma'opo. Oh. Ma and the flesh is really 
really orange and yellow in color or, or yellow orangey in color. So maybe it has more beta carotene. We'll have to use your nutrient. Uh, I don't know. What is it? Your nutrient? Meter. Yeah, right. Or, yeah. Maybe we can see if there, the nutrient differences and varieties. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, my opa was great. I mean, it's just this beautiful tree, um, beautiful fruit. It's a hard variety. So it's firm, um, which, by the way, um, you know, through my experience in processing, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of ulu um you know there's kind of like a softer variety and then the harder variety um ma'afala would fall into a softer fleshed variety which tends to be more susceptible to fruit damage so like looking at ulu on a commercial scale ma'afala is great because it's highly productive you know it's it's kind of easier to to harvest but the downside is that, yeah, it is more susceptible to fruit injury and, you know, it's not as aesthetically beautiful as like some of the other varieties. It also, being that it's a smaller fruit is a higher cost of production. Um, but like big fruits like ma'opo, um, you know, they're, they're harder and they don't get as bruised easily. Um, they, they stay uh, better in this in the chill they don't get like really brown so they're aesthetically you know really nice cool and then <laughs> then you know i was just surprised to hear the, all the different you know when you're speaking about all the different um textures as it softens up and how you can use them in the different ways you can use them it's really cool do you have a particular website that you like to uh, share with people that they could go to to Pear ulu, or is there any any particular well, our website? Of course, eatbreadfruit.com, yes. the Good. Hawaii ulu Bob's website, and and what is we that? Have... What's the website? Eatbreadfruit.com. Okay, that's easy. Good. And we have, gosh, oh, a huge collection of breadfruit recipes, which you can sort by maturity stage, um, and even like dietary requirements from um oh, there you yeah, go. You go up the recipes in the in the mega menu at the top Beautiful. right there and you can see diet specific recipes we have ulu recipes and you know ulu is like the core of you know our 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 mission and and values but really co-crops have have come in to support ulu just like in in uh, agroforestry system where you have ulu as you know, one of the components, of, you know, all of the other plants in a diversified system, you know, have this, this synergy. And so we're seeing this synergy also in, you know, manufacturing, like being able to provide, you know, work for employees all year long. Right. Um, different crops because breadfruit is so seasonal. We have to, you know, being able to process other things is, is great. And also, it uh, allows us to open up the market and into the market, you know, now we have Kalo and Walla and Palaai, uh, or just squash, the wine word for squash, and cassava. Um, oh, good. So, yeah. Cassava, oh my God, I just just love that plant. You know, I had, I had a cassava egg omelet, you know, a grated cassava, and I was just like floored. It was so good, you know. Um, yes. And so, you know, so you're making ulu flour through the cooperative too? Are you making cauliflower and yeah, yep. and that, that's beautiful. I mean, yeah, that's so wonderful. The up question, you know, I know your website and I just really love seeing it. Thank you, Katie, for getting it up. I think um, you know, there's just a um, uh, awareness, kind of like we're almost at the. Uh, Turn in the corner of awareness for Ulu, and we really need to. You know, I'm so happy that we're doing this tonight because this 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 is what it needs. Uh, more and more people talking about it, using it, and uh, getting it more into our daily diets, so we can be healthier. And you know, a lot of a lot of what really upsets me with this pandemic is I never hear the media talking about the importance of keeping our immune system strong. You know. Uh, and how to do that, and especially with our local foods and being able to, you know, put the diets forward in a way that can really support people's well-beings. And so uh, 
you being on tonight is, is our way of doing that as an organization to really stress the importance of, you know, when people go, well, you know, this, this, this virus is really deadly and blah, 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 I get it, you know, but at the same time, you know, you have a better chance. I, there was a report that said that three out of a hundred my age uh, are dying of COVID. And I go, well, if you put those hundred people in the gym, you know, I know I wouldn't be in the top 10, and I know I wouldn't be in the top 20, <laughs> you know, and I could go right down the line. I'm not, I, I just don't see myself succumbing to any kind of a, of a thing like that. And, and it's mainly because of how I take care of myself and, and how other people need to take care of themselves in a way that, you know, you eat well, and you take care of yourself, you get body work and, and you stay on this plane longer, you know, nature's not out to get us. But, you know, when we act stupid and we denature our food supply and we dump a bunch of poisons in the in the ground and in our oceans and our drinking water, I mean, what do you expect? You soil the nest. That's what's going to happen. So, you know, I don't want to get off on any kind of a rant here, but at the same time, it's really important. And uh, I mean, look at you. You're 105 years old. And you're looking like, uh, you know, you're not not anywhere near 30 yet. So it's all Hulu. It's all Hulu. <laughs> <laughs> it's all Hulu, baby. You know, so it's it's cool, and and I, I'm really excited about what the, what this represents. Someone's showing a picture of Hulu. You know, um, with with uh, your website and all the different varieties, it's, you know, Ken Love has made posters of avocados and mangoes. Has he made one for Hulu yet? Do you know if there's one been made for Hulu? I don't think he's made one, but the Bread Food Institute has one. And I think that there's oh, good. 30 varieties on it. We used to carry them. Um, I, we've been out for a while. So that would be a good thing to get back on our, our you know, website. Um, interestingly enough, uh, our varieties page on our website, you know, across like, you know, compared to like our, our you know, nearly 100 pages on our website is the most, one of the most visited. So oh, wow. Know, Oh, and like you know people want to know about breadfruit varieties so that's kind of cool oh that's we, good that's we wonderful about the different varieties on our website too good good <laughs> well that's uh, encourage folks to get there and and to and to you know to plug into that as a matter of fact katie you know we need to be putting websites like this up on our website so people can link right into them you know and put the ulu cooperative uh logo there and then put a hot link to the website and you know I because know. in essence you know you're yeah no absolutely you know we we need to be able to cross pollinate uh with one another and you know i always enjoy um being in the presence of you and donna and and no i mean you guys you folks are rock stars and and it's really a sweet thing to see what you're doing and how you work so closely and collaboratively together uh, is there any questions that are coming in the the chat here from people, let's see. Um, my my ulu trees are over sixty years old, still producing and spreading roots all over. And that's from Peter. That's our friend Peter, and trees are sprouting everywhere. So 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 it's the ulu drops and they start they start sending up babies, huh? And well, uh, not all of them. So not all varieties have seeds, and ulu mostly propagates through uh, adventitious root shoots. So the roots that are on the surface level, when they get nicked or injured, they'll the hormones come through and they'll produce cakey shoots. And oh. so, like I think you said, like the spreading roots and and trees are sprouting everywhere. Um, yeah, it's just something that you see uh, in in a ulu orchard or. Um, okay, so yeah. you could cut you could cut the root, you could cut that section of the root and and where it's sprouting up and actually put that in a pot and you have a you have a tree right yep you can certainly yep. do that and you can even harvest the root with the cakey on it um, oh nice 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 and that's so, another thing of just like how prolific and giving ulu is it's so giving i you know one of the things too is the um it's i visited i got to visit the sandalwood forest malka of ho now now and I stayed up there one night. There's cabins up there, and the and the man that bought that land, um, Chris Lee, um, he is uh, decanting or not decanting. He's um, what do you call it? Uh, getting the getting the sandalwood oil out of the. He's taking out the the dead logs, which still has the sandalwood oil in it, and 
when he takes out these dead logs, all of a sudden, all the babies come up. You know, it's once the mother's removed and it's dead. So he's actually reforesting by culling all the dead wood. And then, but the oil's still inside. So he's able to, you know, uh, he has the process of being able to get the oil out of the wood. And then the mulch is amazing. You know, mm -hmm. the sandalwood mulch. So, and that's the same with Koa. Koa is the same way. And so there's a beautiful area up there with all these reforesting of sandalwood and koa happening. And then there's wild horses up there. And it's just like, whoa, wow, yeah. you know? Yeah, you know, very yeah. cool. I, I, I call it, <laughs> so I've been interested in uh, making uh, Ulu Alaya. Um, it's like Ulu surfboard is like solid, you know, wood plank. And um, I, I mean, the thought of cutting down an old Ulu tree is kind of like cringing because, you know, it's like this grandmother Ulu. But then at the same time, you know, there's like these keikis that shoot up underground uh, next to it. Um, so, yeah, it's like, mm. <laughs> yeah, right. an old Ulu tree, probably not, but there's still lots of Ulu trees that could take its place. Or if a mother right. leaves behind her keiki. Right on, right on. Yeah. And if someone asked about uh, the uh, um, yellowing of the Ulu trees, uh, so the Ulu leaves, would it be possible solutions to yellow, yellowing Ulu leaves? And that's a nitrogen defic deficiency. Usually um, what's happening, you know, good compost dressing would be really good. Do you find any of your trees going through any kind of uh, leaf issues that uh, uh, when you provide any kind of a, a dressing to it, that it, it helps mitigate that? Yeah, so um, Dr. Noah Lincoln is putting together a paper on um, pests and disease for breadfruit with some like, you know, preliminary uh, recommendations um, for mitigating those. Um, and so that'll be out pretty soon. I'm, I'm not too sure when exactly, but in general, you know, with plant, you know, pests and disease, just having, you know, full, you know, that they're nourished and not deficient in anything. So like a well-balanced fertilizer is probably a good way to start. Also want to think about like airflow, you know, is it crowded by other trees? Um, yeah, those, those would be the first things that I look at. Okay, cool. Yeah, right. The light, like you say, getting in there. Uh, let me see somebody saying, anybody have any ideas where to start new Ulu farms on the big island? Imagine a lot of land that is used for ranching would produce a lot more calories. Um, yeah, so Ulu agroforestry. Yeah, right. It's the whole infrastructural thing, you know, to be able to get a farm going and get making sure water's available to get those trees up and established and that's always an issue uh, around getting any kind of a farm going, you know, the, the amount of, the amount of, yeah. And that was right. That was the distilling. Thanks, Brian, the distilling of, of sandalwood oil. Um, let me see. Can Anissa provide the spelling of the firm textured breadfruit, which was her favorite variety? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat box. Okay, cool. And let's see what else. Um, more about Anissa, uh, saw how she how you saw the people of Samoa, Samoa pruning their ulu trees. Yeah, the most beautiful ulu tree that I saw while I was there was one that was in somebody's front yard and it was maybe 30, 40 years old. So it had a thick trunk and it was only 18 feet high. And hmm. then the width of the canopy was probably at least 26 feet in wide. Like it was huge. It, the, the canopy was wider than it was tall, of course. Um, and so to do that, they would just cut off the new shoots every year that are going vertical. Right, right. And so yeah. I, I've, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. That's right. Because, you know, the, the leaders always want to, the tree always sends up its leaders. They always have to have a uh, have a leader that's going skyward, and then the side branches branch out. Peter Solaris was saying, you know, that's when he trellises. What they do basically is they 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 train the branches on a forty five, so they still have this sense that they're they're leading upwards. You know, they're leading upwards, but they're um, he's training them to go sideways, so they get more fruit fruit production that way. Uh, and it doesn't become all it doesn't become all leaves. You're just going skyward. 
And, uh, yeah, and so you will do that as soon as you prune it, it'll just shoot right back up. And, you know, I've seen some farmers do annual prunings and, you know, they're just constantly taking down the new shoots. I, I think it does affect the yield in fruit, but that's kind of, you know, just through observation. Um, and then like we have another farmer who's actually our highest producing farmer. He's in Hona now, has 18 trees and, hmm. you know, fourth generation farmer. Anyhow, it's in the middle of a coffee field and there's space 40 feet apart. So they have a wow. lot more spacing than the recommended 30 feet. So they're getting 360 degrees of sun, the canopy, and he only prunes um, once every four years. So wow. I think that, um, you know, the, the prunings is, I think it's just a lot of stress for the trees um, too. So it's kind of like just one of those things you got to balance, I guess. Right. Uh, Peter was asking, is it unusual to have three fruits on one branch? You see, sometimes you'll have. Uh, yeah, I mean, that can, that can happen um, when it's a healthy tree. I mean, it can be really productive. I mean, breadfruit trees on average produce 30, 300 pounds of fruit a year, but I wow. mean, they can go well upwards to, you know, 1200 pounds. Um, and that's if, you know, it's got a nice canopy and, you know, lots of, of um, you know, nutrients. They love to be fed. Um, and they're just like any crop, you know, if we're, if we're harvesting, you still got to put something back into the soil since the right. fruit isn't falling and that nutrient cycle isn't happening. That's right. And do you chop and drop when so you prune? It's not, it, it's not recommended that you chop and drop ulu and feed ulu to ulu. <laughs> no right. kind of ulu. Um, but <laughs> um, you can chop and chop and drop ulu and like put it into like you know maybe a neighboring like banana patch or feeding some of your other plants um but to be compost honest it, and, compost it I and then bring it back to, um mm -hmm. you know i guess just general sanitation practices you want to get like the dead branches out any diseased fruit and stuff out of the field but um to be honest like we we chop and drop especially with some of the larger trees that you know we're trying to to reclaim um so that they're they're more manageable uh, to harvest um and, and the average age the average age i mean i know there's one in lahaina that was is believed to be one of the original ulu trees over lahaina side that made up that whole belt of ulu that's wow. right by steakhouse yeah and Wait. they were trying to do, what's that I should have visited that one. Oh yeah, you would have loved it. Is they tried? We tried. We had a couple of farmers, nurserymen here, as part of our um, part of our Kamehameha Schools um, grant. You know, to get air layers from that tree, it just wouldn't allow us to air layer it. It's kind of interesting. At a certain age, it just didn't want to be so air layered. Air, have, you, air, have you done any air layering? Ulu? Yeah, so air layering ulu, you, it doesn't have a great success rate. Um, and in fact, I, I've seen very little success and just just to throw out a word or a, a percentage, maybe 20% success rate. Oh, wow. Whereas if you do um, root, root propagation, so you're collecting a piece of the root um, and then, you know, maybe transferring that over to soil, um, and, you know, letting the shoot sprout from there or that root develop from there, um, that has a higher success rate. And so you can also do, um, you can't, well, so air layering in the canopy is mm -hmm. low success rate. So excuse me, um, just want to be clear here. So air layering in the canopy, probably 20% success rate. If you're air layering from a root shoot, meaning that the shoot is vertical coming directly from the root, that has about 80% success rate. And you were saying that, that you scar the root and that helps bring up the baby? Yeah. So at Amy Greenwell, they had, you know, the old Hawaiian trees there and they had been mowing and weed whacking. And so all of all of those like, you know, uh, dis disrupted roots, they would throw up tons of keiki. Um, but in our nursery um, at the farm, we do adventitious root shoot propagation where we take a chunk of uh, ulu root about an arm's length and we okay. scar the top about, you know, once every inch, not that very deep, about, you know, maybe a millimeter or so uh -huh. and put that in the ground. And I think after eight weeks, more or less, they they will produce shoots and they'll produce wow. shoots 
for like two years, you know, maybe some chunks like producing 30 shoots, um, you know. Over so you're taking, you're taking an arm's length and, and, the, and the size of the root, what's the diameter of the root? Yeah, so the diameter of the root can be as little as, let's just say, half an inch to um, as big as like, you know, six inches, eight inches. Okay. However, the the um, ideal size, I would say, is somewhere around like three quarters of an inch to two inches. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. And and then you get, you're get you getting that and you're scarring it and you're sticking it underneath the soil, putting it in a pot or... You know, but you're you're going on. You're you're putting a little layer of soil. To top. Probably some compost would be really good too in that spirit. Um, and then uh, and the babies are coming up. That's great. That's great. How about there's one question? Jana Boggs is asking a question about uh, how's the ulu with handling the wind. Ulu is not good at handling wind because of the broad leaf structure. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it just like blow them off. Also the branches are pretty brittle. And so they break very easily in the wind. Um, mm -hmm. in, in, in ancient Hawaii, they planted Ulu in the gulches. So, mm -hmm. uh, and not windy places. Of course, Kealikikua, you know, were protected by the Maunas and like, there's not a whole lot oh. of wind here. Um, so that's an ideal condition. Um, but, you know, in, in Hilo side, they would grow the ulu in the gulches. So it was protected from the Hilo winds. Um, so, and, but, you know, like large hurricanes, such as the one that happened, um, I think, recently in, in Haiti, um, mm -hmm. you know, there was, and, and even in Puerto Rico, the ulu trees were, you know, devastated in that, like it took off the whole canopy. But Ulu is so resilient that, you know, even though the, the whole tree has gone and it's just a stump, it will grow back. And in right. fact, I do believe that is a, a pruning method as well. And it is yes. a, a method that I've seen in Samoa where they take, you know, large ulu trees and they hack them down to like maybe a five foot stump and then let the kiki shoot from That's there. Right. Um, That's right. And it, and I think it's even reasonable to do um, in, in the younger years, like right now, if we took our ulu trees that are Hawaiian, and I say that variety because they tend to grow more lengthy, um, right. if we were to stump them like three feet or so, they'll put out um, new lower lying branches that are, that are more like angled and, and horizontal. Right. right. Well, that's a great place to close i know i was just blown away that we'd gotten through our time so quickly and i know you have to get a plane to catch tonight to go to the mainland i so appreciate that you came on tonight especially under the circumstances so thank you so much dear you know yeah. you're always always a pleasure to spend time with you and and it was so informative tonight i think everybody just really appreciates uh, all that you shared i know i did and and uh thank you Thank you for being here tonight. Any closing statement you want to make? Um, yeah, the Ulu Co-op is an excellent resource on Ulu, same with the Breadfruit Institute. Um, so you can, if you wanted to learn more, check check into their their websites. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. It's just it's a pleasure to to talk about breadfruit and and share you know things that I've learned. I'm passionate about it, and so I always enjoy sharing and. You know, if you guys wanted to, um, you know, ask me any questions, um, I'll throw my email into the chat box, and then okay. that way you can. And social um, media, social media too. Tell us about your you know, social media. And on social media, um, I do the Hawaii Ulu Co-op social media, so you can chat okay. with me there. And then, of course, I also have um, my personal account as well. Um, Great. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. Safe trails, happy trails. And under the circumstances, you just send all your love to your family, our love to your family, and uh, and we'll see you when you come back. Sounds good. Thank you so much. All right, Anissa. Love you, honey. Take care. Okay. You, thank you so much for your your music playing. It's beautiful. Yes. yes. So nice to hear you. Thank you. I'm so glad we got to do this together, and I got to be here just to learn about Ulu and. I do look forward to using it more in my own life. I actually live on a street called Ululani now, and we have <laughs> a little tree. So if you see that sign missing pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
<laughs> then, yeah, then I, I got it for you. <laughs> um, oh, I actually you. was blessed enough to travel to, um, to Samoa myself about 10 years ago. I sailed there. Um, and it was amazing to see how much of their food they're growing. And it's a, it's a mirror of Hawaii. It's in the South uh, Hemisphere and it has the big island and then the littler islands. Um, and the big island there is called Savai'i. And here it's Hawaii, you know, and it's just, it's such a mirror and it's amazing how close to the land they are and how close to each other as well. Mm -hmm. All right, um, shall I share a song? Okay, cool. This is one of the first songs that I wrote actually. Oh, go ahead, Vince. Cannot hear you. <clears throat> oh wait, I found you. Okay, our next speaker series will, uh, what I'm working to do is get uh, the farmers that we're gonna go visit to come on kind of like a panel and uh, for the convention. So that's gonna be on uh, two weeks from now. So I'll work on that and we'll have that. We love uh, having these and appreciate having these. So, oh, there's Ollie. Hello, Ollie, that's our youngest member right there, Katie's baby, Ollie. So, Edine, please take us out with some of your beautiful music. And thank you everybody for being on tonight. All right, this is uh, one of the first songs I wrote and it actually came through. I was traveling the big island with Medicine for the People and we were traveling to places like Hip Agriculture and they, uh, yeah, we just grew so much music and so much community together here on the big island. And yeah, it was just such a bubbling time of so much music. So I wanted to play this song for y'all. Mm -hmm. Listen up, child, listen up, good, there is illusion afoot in every neighborhood, and it is upheld by media and mass industry that we must change ourselves and consume to be free, but the chains round our necks, they feel like shackles to me, let's escape mental bondage, and in our minds be free of the lies we're told. Garbage was so involved against the darkness spread by the mosquitoes. We can do so much better than we are doing. We can heal everything that we've been destroying. We understand so much that we are now revealing. Let's let the rubber hit the road. Let's start the healing. The water comes in bottles, the way we farm it kills the lamb. We get taken advantage of in any way they can. So keep vigilant and wary of the easy that they sell and may be easy now, but in the end it will be ill. Can't say that I believe in the way that we live. I don't want to hand the world off the way it is to our kids. And I don't think the one with the most is the best. And I tell you, the emperor is not dressed. I will not let fear enter my heart. Gathering courage is a star. Soon and tall and strong is what's around us. Ready for a gentler order to begin. Gentler order to begin. Return to evil. We can do so much better than we are doing. We can heal everything that we've been destroying. We understand so much that we are not feeling. Let's let the road be hit the road and start the healing. I hear someone playing. Confidence is nil. Doesn't come in a brand name or in a bottle or a pill. We need to reach deep, deep, deep down inside ourselves. Oh, that's the only root and 
true and tireless well so i say arm yourself with dignity arm yourself with grace redeem the recent past of our wasteful human race awareness is the key to identify what we should do and the future of the planet will it rest squarely on me and you and you Very appropriate for these this day. This yeah, day I really age. wanted to sing it for y'all because that I really, I, you know, I feel like music, community, food is just so basic in humanity, and that's the roots of everything. And so, as we really focus on those those parts of life, um, yeah, that's where the healing is. We're yeah, it's such a weird world right now, you know, for all of us. So, just yeah, yeah being there for one another is one of the biggest parts of it so this next well song, said. Well um, said. thanks this next song uh i wrote actually about some of the members of hfu and uh just other other people around hawaii who have really inspired me about farming and permaculture so i hope you enjoy this one maybe you'll recognize who some of these verses are about actually you probably will He's got a PhD in the IMO. He's spreading the fungus everywhere that he goes. He's getting amongst the fungus, among us to revitalize the soil matrix. Mm. <laughs> revitalize that soil matrix. Oh, oh yeah. To keep the water clean, he's got a bit of a dream, a bit of a plan, a very bit of a scheme. When a girl comes around, he can spin the head of her, offering up the scent of the vetiver. Mm -hmm. Offering up the scent of the vetiver. Mm -hmm. Cause he's a permie, he likes the vermiculture, you heard me. He used pigeon peas as a mulch, yeah, big and strong. And he's got it going on cause he's milking his goats at six in the morning. Milking his goats at six in the morning. She's in the garden nearly every single day. She's in the garden nearly every single day. She's in the garden nearly every single day. Planting her garden every day. Oh shoot. <laughs> oh, one more time. Okay. She's in the garden nearly every single day. The planet is her garden, tending is away, offering up sweets of a fruit, born of the sweat and the dirt on a booze, dirt on a booze sweat. Dirt on a booze. We got folks who just banana crazy, the light in the eyes of bananas amaze me. Talking bananas till the cows come back, the Cuban red, the size of that rack. Uh huh. Head and the size of that rack, so delicious. Uh, why? Because I'm a permie. I like the vermal culture. You heard me. I use pigeon peas as my mulch. Yeah, big and strong. And I got it going on because I'm milking my goats at six in the morning. Okay, it's like eight in the morning, maybe 10, but I'm milking my goats. Oh. <laughs> We got the mycorrhizae to stabilize ya. Underground highways deliver fertilizer. If you want your garden to be all it can be, fertilizer, I am O and that compost tea. I am O and that compost tea. Cause we are permies, we like the vermiculture. I me, mean, we use pigeon peas as a mulch, yeah. We get strong, got it going on, cause we know the goats at six in the morning, seven in the morning, eight in the morning, nine in the morning, okay, maybe 10 in the morning. Hermes, 
<laughs> Anyone get have a guess at who some of those verses were about? All right, let's see if anyone comes up with them. So this next song. Do you know, do you know Drake, uh, Edeen? Edeen, do you know Drake? Yes. Yes, yes. So uh, he was on earlier. And oh, cool. uh, yeah, he would love that song for sure. Yeah, he's oh. definitely heard it before. We oh, have, good. Yeah, we've run in the same dirt circles. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, I'm, I'm an IMO foe. Yeah, I... Uh, I, I did um, a class with Master Cho with Drake back in the day, 2012. So, uh, yeah, love that. Love those protocols. So it's great. You got a song about it. Thank you. Yeah, it's amazing about microbiomes. I mean, in our own bodies, on the Truly. planet, that there's more, there's more microbial cells in our body than human cells. That's right. Not by volume, but by um, number. Sure number. That's right. Yeah, they, they, digest our body. Us. They, they really make us run. So he was the yeah. first one who opened my eyes to honoring that whole system and even realizing that it was there. And he, for me, he was early on really understanding that and spreading that knowledge. So I've always been yeah. grateful to Drake for that. Yep. Yep. Drake's, uh, he's our East Hawaii president. So really wonderful to have him as in our leadership team and, uh, He'll be here for our convention. He'll be coming over. So, yeah, it'll be great to have that happen. Nice. Yeah, so you're going to close out? You got one more song to close this out? Yeah, I'm um, considering. Okay, I think I will play um, Belly of the Whale. And this song, it's kind of a multi-layered song. And it's the title track of my album that we finished in 2019, which seems so long ago at this point. But uh yeah, grateful to be able to play music, grateful to be able to be with you guys and be a part of the community. Um, so this song's called Belly of the Whale. Thank you, dear. It's great music. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So I dove down into the belly of the whale. I'm diving down further, deep, deep down still. I see the weeds, I've to find the roots. Clean up my sacred garden so I can offer sacred fruits and sacred fruits come through in the form of ancient truth. Sacred fruits come through in the form of ancient truth. My body talking, talking, telling of the wounds. A mother's pain I carry from the line of sacred womb. Working hard, cracking callus, fingers to the bone. To build us up a house, make the house a home, mother. Yeah. Mother. Disregard all the thanks she got was slim. She gave all that she had, and then she gave, she gave again, and take we did. Ever sucking selfish at the spout, never realize that the mana of the mother could run out. In the belly of the way as I think of the children. Oh, the future generation. Yeah. 
brought in We're leaving them with unprecedented Blood on their hands of water Toxic, no way to wash it off The eye not tired The womb is drying up And I dive and I dive and I dive and I dive down Oh, I dive, yes, I dive, oh, I dive, oh, I dive down in the belly of the wave. The good news is that the conscious shift, the consciousness is in. A conscious shift, the consciousness is in. A conscious shift, the consciousness is in. Love and respect your neighbor, I know, learn, learn to quietly sit with yourself. Discover inner peace and inner wealth and pass it on to all. All we come upon, we will live long, long. We will live on. tread lightly all the mother we come from we will tread lightly lightly for the future generations we're in the belly of the will the will the will the will the will the will we're in the belly of the will the will the will the will the will we're in the valley of the way. We're in the valley of the way. We're in the valley of the way. <laughs> how sweet how sweet you know Edina, um uh, a day and kai who was a who's a very accomplished uh musician and did one of our speaker series is on tonight listening to you so i'm really uh oh wow oh yeah dan's really a uh, great brother and it's, it's nice that he's here listening to you and, i and was amazed at all the um, incredible musicians you guys have had play and i'm so grateful that hawaii's community is that strong that you know yes. we have all of these different sides of of you know real powerhouses and and from the heart so thank yes. you for having me tonight and thank you for everyone who plays music i appreciate you and, and who farms also and creates community yes yes it's such a both art forms are are so important together you know and that's uh uh we do have quite the mus musical artist here in the islands that support us in our process i don't know if you got to hear our last year micah nelson put together quite a concert for us for our convention a three-hour concert that we can get you access to katie would you send her the link please and uh yeah yeah it'll be, it'll be a wonderful thing and so thank you for being in the family um if you're not a member already we we are making you one tonight so uh um, got my card in the mail i'm official oh good oh good well thank you and and we so appreciate you coming on and your music is beautiful and i love i love your microbe i i, I want to get to hear that again where can i hear that um that one's just kind of alive <laughs> performance okay <laughs> okay well i want to hear it again so we'll... yeah, maybe i'll take a video or something and post it somewhere i'll let you know if i get that one out okay great and please get katie your contact information so we can keep in touch okay sounds great thank you so much you're so welcome our pleasure all the best and and everyone again i just got um 
I just got confirmation from Christopher Desbit out of Belize, who does agricultural um, forest systems. Yeah, permaculture systems, agroforestry systems will be presenting at our convention. So uh, we're just working out the date, make sure that he can make it on the 4th. And uh, so that will round out our expert presentations for our breakfast time for the convention. And uh, he does agroforestry there in Belize, and it'll be wonderful to have him on board too, along with uh, Dan Kittredge and um, uh, Ray Archuleta. So right on folks, please uh, look forward uh, to our website. Hey, Katie will be sending out information about the convention as we move forward here. You'll hear a lot of it in the next few weeks. So stay tuned and please sign up and, and influence others to also know that this is happening and hopefully you'll all be there. So with that said, have a good night, everybody. Be well, stay positive and test negative. We love you. Aloha. Thank you, Katie. And thank you, Anissa.